We are now live. It's 1031. It's not Wes's fault. It's my fault. Okay. So when we, when we don't have a live stream at 10:30, we use, who knows when we'll start? It could be 10:34. I don't even know. But we're trying to keep on for those of you at home. Glad you're all here. Let's stand and worship. Yeah, let's stand and worship <laughs> together now. I was almost going to need you to lead me. Good morning, everyone. I'm really, really happy to see everybody here. I got to say, it's been a bit strange singing to a wall in my bedroom uh, most of the year, so I'm really happy that you're here with me. Lord, I thank you once again for all the folks that are here and all the folks that are at home watching with us. And uh, I just ask that you bless us this morning with your peace. And um, as we sing to you, please just bless us with, with the fruits of your spirit, God.
and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Sing it with me one more time. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. Holy Spirit, come. God, that's my simple prayer this morning. Please just come fill up this room, fill up our hearts, fill up our homes. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 That's a good prayer. We're a church, if you don't know much about OCV, that desires to follow where the Holy Spirit wants to lead us. I mean, Christianity is this triune faith, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we don't want to leave any of those three out. So, yeah, it's a good, good prayer, really. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Well, we're going to continue our discussion around the theme of wisdom today, but first I just want to take a second and continue that in the vein of prayer and just quiet our hearts before God. Put away anything in our minds that wants to distract us. And just give our ears and the eyes of our heart to the Lord. Father God, we pray that you would be present in our midst through your spirit this morning. We know you have promised to be with us, so our prayer is also primarily that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Hearts that are open and receptive to your truth, to your love, to your life. Lord, we lift up people in our church to you at this moment who are suffering through a variety of illnesses, ailments, mental struggles, struggles with addiction. Lord, we specifically pray today for Mark Hutchinson that you would take his pain away, that you would let this back surgery that he's had really do what it was designed to do. And Lord, just scale back the pain in his life, in his body. And Lord, we continue to lift up our sister, Kim Carvin. And we pray for your divine healing. And there are many others. We lift them to you, even in our own minds in this minute. And God, now I ask that you would speak through me, speak through your word for our edification, God, and, and for our participation in your great mission. We know you are working, God, and we want to be part of what you're doing. Show us the way. Give us the courage. Give us the stamina. Give us friends to journey with. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to jump right in today. So the first thing I want to do, I'm going to tell you a story in just a minute. But first I'm going to read the text that's going to anchor our discussion today. Because today we're going to look at the wisdom of guarding our hearts. And the proverb that's anchoring this today comes out of Proverbs chapter 4. And I'm going to start in verse 20. 
And this text will kind of be in the back of our minds throughout the rest of the day. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart. Some translations say guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. We're going to look at this nugget of wisdom today, this idea that guarding our hearts is actually one of the most important things we can do. Keeping our hearts with all vigilance, all diligence, some translations say. This in moment-by-moment acts of obedience in this coming year. But the first, the way we're going to enter into this discussion is actually with a story. And if any of you are, we're on social media, I, I posted this week that Joseph Conrad's book, Heart of Darkness, is actually going to be the way into this story. So Conrad was a Polish-British author. This is, by the way, for all the literature lovers out there. And even if there's only two of us or three, it's for you, okay? So feel special today. If you're a literature hater, I'm sorry. You know, I don't know what to do with you, but I still love you, okay? So in his 1899 novel, Heart of Darkness, this retired seaman, Joseph Conrad, Polish-British writer, wrote in English, gives us a 75-page, very short, look into the human heart. And he does it by reflecting on his own experience as a trader in the Dutch Congo. And or the, yeah, Belgian Congo. And so as he recounts this, the story is set, he was, this is an old grizzled sailor recounting to some sailors around a wharf of like what he experienced on a trip. And this is what he recalls. The trip was to find and bring back a certain Mr. Kurtz, a very successful trader in the heart of darkness, as Europeans thought of it, Congo, the middle of darkest, deepest, darkest Africa. Remember, this is a colonial mindset. In the process of telling the story, Conrad highlights how condescending, racist, and even uh, you know, how, how misguided social Darwinism was, because these Europeans thought they were so much higher above this heart of darkness, and Conrad shows, actually, it might not be quite like that. So here's how the story goes. Marlow goes on a months-long journey into Africa, up the Congo River. And along the way, there's a series of mishaps we don't need to go into, but he eventually hears more and more word of this Mr. Kurtz. And it seems as if he's revered greatly. He has sold, traded more ivory, which was, you know, the way you became rich, than some whole regions out of his one trading post. And then they found out he's almost like a prodigy. I mean, he could do, he was a poet, he could paint. This guy seemed to command the respect and even demand the jealousy of almost anyone that came in contact with him. But he was an enigma. He was far, far inland. The problem is that by the time Marlowe gets there, it's only when he arrives that he realizes the truth that Mr. Kurtz has gone insane. He is mad. His lust for power, his unrelenting greed, they've driven him crazy. In this remote place, Kurtz was overcome by these things in his heart, his greed, his drive for power. He commanded the native people to fulfill his desires, to get more ivory and the raw things that were needed for trade. And in the process, he functioned as judge, jury, and even executioner. One of the first things Marlowe sees when he comes in is heads on stakes along the river. And eventually, he was even demanded to be worshipped as a god. This is the human heart unleashed without any constraint. But then when we find him in the story, all this is in the past, and Kurtz is on death's door. He's very sick. His power, his wealth, his prestige, and seeming invincibility are gone. And the narrator's with him when he dies. I'm going to read this paragraph. One evening... Coming in with a candle, I was startled to hear him say a little tremulously, I'm lying here in the dark waiting for death. Now the light was within a foot from his eyes. I forced myself to murmur, oh, nonsense, and stood over him as if transfixed. Anything approaching the change that came over his features I've never seen before. 
and hope to never see again. I wasn't touched. I was fascinated. It was as though a veil had been rent. I saw in that ivory face the expression of somber pride, ruthless power, craven terror, of an intense and hopeless desire. Did he live his life again in every detail of desire, temptation, and surrender during that supreme moment of complete knowledge when he was on death's doorstep? He cried in a whisper at some image, at some vision. He cried out twice, a cry that was no more than a breath. The horror. The horror. And the next moment, one of the servants, he leaves the next moment, one of the servants comes in and says, Mr. Kurtz, he dead. What Conrad does is shine a light into the human heart turned in on itself to a complete darkness that even when the light was there, he said, I don't see it. We see with the narrator at the end, the heart of darkness is not a place on a map. It's not a color on our skin, but it's an internal reality that could potentially, and is really, the Bible even tells us, within each of us. And then if it's left to its own devices, as it was in the case of Mr. Kurtz, even the most civilized person can turn into a savage. We don't really need to look very far at the history of the 20th century to see that over and over again in the carefully planned, even civilized programs of annihilation that not just one country, sure we think of Germany and the Nazis, but it's not just once that has happened in the 20th century and continues to happen today, but it over and over. And as we get more and more civilized and as our technical expertise gets better, it's easier and easier to do. And all of it stems from the darkness in the human heart. The darkness that overtook Mr. Kurtz in Conrad's story, the darkness that overtook so many. And by the way, many critics think this is a character model on real life events. Power corrupts, right? And colonial power in Africa led to atrocities over and over again that Conrad probably witnessed. Now, why? This is a little bit different than I normally start with. So, you know, I don't normally start by reading out of a a novel, and and don't worry if you didn't like it, it's not going to happen every week. But once in a while, our poets and our novelists can say it really well, better than we can speak it in plain language. And Jesus knew that too, by the way. Side note, how did Jesus, the wisest, by the way, wisest person that ever lived, if you don't think of Jesus as the most intelligent, wisest person that ever lived, you're selling him short. He is God with flesh on. He is, has access to the entire wisdom of God. Solomon pales in comparison. If you want a coach to living smartly, living wisely, there is no one better than Jesus. All these Proverbs point to the truth that he reveals. How did Jesus tell truth? He used stories time and time again because we humans have an ear for stories. You might forget everything else I said today, but there's going to be some parts of that story that will stick with you, even if it's the heads on poles. Right? We humans have an ear for it. The other thing we all have in common, in addition to our ear for stories, is the fact that we all have within us a heart that has darkness in it. Now, that doesn't mean we're overcome by it, but we all have the propensity to give in to the whispers of the enemy. None of us are immune to it. None of us. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're an elder, whether you're a Sunday school teacher or whether you're the person on the street, no one's immune to the whispers, to the fanning of the flame of that heart of darkness in us. And this is a very biblical concept. The prophet Jeremiah, who knew suffering, and he knew what giving in to sin would do. That's why he's called the weeping prophet. He has this verse in Jeremiah 17, and we'll be returning to this chapter later, But in Jeremiah 17, 9, he says this verse that just is always stuck with me. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Some English translations say desperately wicked. Who can understand it? 
right? If you've lived very long, you've talked to that person where you're like, let me just speak some truth to you, and they just are, it's, it's too late. They're, they are like, I'm not going to hear it, right? If you, even in, in high school, right, you'd be like your friend, that guy is no good for you. They're like, no, because like, your heart can tell you all kinds of things. It's deceitful. That's why all those songs, listen to your heart, like every Disney movie, I always want to say, let's put an asterisk by that because that's not exactly true. Listen to your heart, it could take you some pretty crazy places. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it, Jeremiah tells us. But that sounds like a nice idea until you see it play out in a story like Heart of Darkness or in in a story like the ones that we each witness in our families and in our community and in our classrooms. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to see it in a friend or a son or a daughter or a parent. In Mr. Kurt's example, we see the results of a vast array of smaller decisions. You don't become someone who says, worship me, overnight. You don't become judge, jury, and executioner overnight. It's little decisions, right? The Nazi regime didn't just one day, you know, arise out of thin air and snap its fingers and start murdering people. Small decisions, small words, those people don't really count. They're less than you. Don't, don't shop at that store. Small decisions, right? And the darkness in our heart grows. And truth becomes harder to, to identify. The truth is we all have a propensity. We're born into and then have a propensity to expand this heart sickness. But it's not hidden from God. And the Bible addresses it numerous times. And the thing is, even though the example of Mr. Kurtz highlights it pretty explicitly, darkness, sin that leads to darkness, always leads to death if it's not addressed. Sin always kills if it's not addressed, if it's not covered by the blood of Jesus. So let's do a little word study. The Hebrew and Greek words for heart in the Bible show up 730 times in the Old Testament and 105 times in the New Testament. Proverbs alone uses the word for heart 50 times. And in the Bible, heart is used to represent the center of which all of a person's psychological and characteristics refer. We might think today of the mind, although even when we talk, we kind of betray ourselves because those songs, listen to your heart, follow your heart, we, know, we kind of think of ourselves as following two kind of different leaders, right? One's mental and one's our heart. For the Bible, the actual heart was the center. You weren't between your rational self and your emotional self. You weren't in some battle. The Bible sees us as really living out of our heart, being the center of who we are. It was the inner man, the hidden person, the central agency and faculty within a man whereby he imagines, intends, purposes, and understands. That about covers it all, where you imagine, where you intend, where you purpose, and where you understand. That's your heart in the Bible. We see these aspects of the heart coming through in biblical passages one after another, and what I'm going to do right now is give you a string of them. I don't often do this, take them out of context, but I just wanted to give you a feel for how this comes up. And you can jot down some notes if you want to look into the context around these verses. And I'll try to lay out a little bit, but I wanted to highlight a few things. So the first thing I want to highlight about what the Bible says about the heart. You can't guard it if you don't know what it does and how it works. The first thing is that it's the true but often hidden essence of our personalities and selves. That's how the Bible talks about it. So think about this. Samuel comes to Jesse, and he lines up all his sons, right? And he looks them over, and they look great. They look strong. Samuel's like, I don't know which one I'm going to anoint. He's listening for the Lord, and then he gets to the end of the line, and he's like, God, uh, you, uh, I think, you know, am I not hearing well today? You didn't tell me to anoint any of these guys. And he says to Jesse, there's got to be someone else, right? And you know how the story goes. This is one of my favorite passages. I know I say that a lot. There are many favorites. But this story is unbelievable, because little known, unknown nobody, Jesse, who 
He doesn't even bring his son in from the field, right? He leaves him out there. He's like, he's not even good enough. The prophet comes. This is the day that a man is going to be made. This is a big day. The prophet comes. Jesse says, David, you stay out there. You don't need to be here. No. And, so, and Samuel says, is there anyone else? And Jesse says, oh, yeah, there's this guy, David. He's out in the field. Brings him in. And you know that verse, right? Before he brings him in, God tells Samuel. When Samuel's like, God, I don't understand. These guys look great to be the next king. God says, man looks at the outer appearance, right? But God looks at the heart. The center part of us, the part that imagines, that purposes, that intends, that understands, the part that makes us us. Jeremiah 17, the same chapter, the verse right after what I read, the heart's deceptive, um, wicked above all things, who can know it, right? The next verse in that section says this, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So the first thing we know about the heart is no matter how much we try to hide it, what's inside cannot be hidden, first from God, and then eventually, as many of you have lived to see, will, will be shown to everyone else eventually, too. You can't hide it forever, right? You can, whatever your heart wants to hide, you can't hide it. None of us can. We can try. We can spin all these kind of webs of lies and things, but eventually, the web breaks down. The thing is, God's never fooled the whole time. God sees our inner being. The second thing, though, and this is an encouraging thing, the second thing the Bible says over and over about the heart is that it's malleable. So even though, as Paul tells us, we're all, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, sins in us, there's no one righteous, no, not one. The, dark, the heart of darkness is in each of us. We have a propensity to evil if we don't address it. But we're not fatalistically doomed to walk in it. Because the heart, the Bible tells us over and over again, is malleable. We can change it. We can work with it. Psalm 119. I preached on this back in the fall when I was preaching on, on the importance of getting Scripture into us. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. The psalmist says this, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it. There's that word again. By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up or hidden, some translations say. Hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How can he make his way straight? The heart has been formed by the word of God. He's hidden it in his heart. He's changed the, the makeup of his heart. He's put this in it. He's tucked it away in there. Proverbs 3, just a few Proverbs, just one proverb back from where we were. Remember, this is the proverb that has that very famous few verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll make straight your paths. Very famous, very important. A couple verses before that, look what he says about the heart. Proverbs 3, verse 3. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you, Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you'll find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. This is not the only time in the Bible that the Old Testament writers say, write them on the tablet of your heart. Get them in there. Inscribe them. Know these words. Just like the psalmist said, hide them up. The problem is that a malleable heart can be used for good or evil, right? If we can change our hearts for good by intentionality and faithfulness to God, we can also inscribe them for evil if we choose the opposite and change them that way. So I said we'd be back to Jeremiah 17. Let me read you a little section of this. Jeremiah 17, verse 1. This is the prophet Jeremiah writing at just about the end of the days of, of the southern kingdom. 
They're about to go into exile. And he's done all he could, but they've given themselves to idols. They've stopped trusting in God, and the prophet, for all his work, can't do anything about it. Listen to what he says. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond. It's engraved on what? The tablet of their heart. And on the horns of their altars. And while their children remember their altars in their ashram, beside every green tree and on the high hills, on the mountains, on the open country, your wealth and all your treasures, I'll give you as spoils for the price of your high places for sin throughout your territory. Thus says the Lord, Curses the man who trusts the man, who makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert. He shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. But, the next verse, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who trusts, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water. He sends out his roots by the stream and does not fear when he comes. For its leaves remain green, and it's not anxious in the year of drought, for he does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And then he tells us who can. I, the Lord, search the heart, and test the mind, and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Right there, Jeremiah says, instead of writing the commands of the Lord, the law of the Lord on the tablets of your heart. Israel, you, Judah, you have written worship of other gods. You've written sin. You've written unfaithfulness. You've written injustice. Like a diamond pen is chiseled away on your heart. And you might think it's hidden, but God can see it. A malleable heart is a gift from God. But like all gifts, we can use it for ill if we want. We can change our hearts with the, with the grace of God toward good or toward evil. So just to, first thing, it's, the heart is the true hidden essence. It's not hidden from God. Second, the heart's malleable. The Bible talks again and again about hiding God's word in our heart, writing on the tablet of our heart, and we can write good or we can write evil. And then thirdly, the heart is worth guarding diligently. Remember that verse we read out of Proverbs 4? Keep your heart, guard your heart with all diligence, with all vigilance. For from it flows the springs of life. No matter what you have going for you, if you lose your heart, if your heart is captured by a false idol, by sin, by a lie, if you lose your heart, you lose it all. No matter what else you have go going for you. That's why the writer of Proverbs says, guard it, keep it with all vigilance, with all diligence. For from it springs everything else. The streams of life come from it. We're only as good as our heart. If your heart is unguarded, your life is a sitting duck. We can't passively allow the world to dictate what enters it. We have to keep it, guard it. And I like how we translators use both of those words. Because keeping it, I mean, it's almost like tending it. Guarding it. Defending it. Do you defend and tend your heart? Tend it. Nurture it. Write God's commands on it. Let God's word be hidden in it. Turn it toward good. And then defend it. Say no to the lies, to the dirt, to whatever the culture wants to throw in. And by the way, it's not just from outside, but the lies we tell ourselves. We're born with a little bit of darkness in there, and it wants to expand. So, how tends your heart? How is it? One last thing I want to say, and then I'm going to give us a couple application points. It is hard to get a good gauge on how our hearts are doing. 
We are super good at rationalizing our thoughts and behavior. Really good. And we can pick it out on other people and then we put a mirror to ourselves and we can't see our own rationalizations. We can see everyone else's but our own. That's how it works. Jesus knew. He's the wisest man that ever lived. And how did he tell us about it? He used some stories because he's wise like that. Listen to this parable in Luke 6. He told him a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall in a pit? A disciple's not above his teacher, but everyone when he's fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take out the speck that's in your eye, when you yourself don't see the log that's in your own, you know? You can't even reach the speck because your eye is in the way. The visual, huh? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. And then you'll see clearly to take out the speck that's in your brother's. And then we can stop that story or we can keep going because Jesus is giving a little message that's connected here to this next part. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from the bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person, out of the evil treasure, and we can infer of his heart or her heart, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. When we ask ourselves, how fares our heart? Beware, your heart will deceive you. We're very good at rationalizing our own stuff. We're like the people in that parable. When we hear it in a story, we're like, I'd never see the speck and not see the log, and yet we do it. All of us, myself, you. We have a tendency toward it, at the very least, we have to admit. Rationalization comes naturally to human beings. So if we want to know how our heart's doing, we actually look at the fruit of our lives. And not the fruit just one day, not the fruit on Sunday morning, which could be good because, I don't know, sometimes with kids, Sunday mornings are rough, I can admit. (laughs) You'll notice we haven't quite brought ours yet for various reasons, one being that Amy by herself, I don't think can control those four kids. They'll come eventually. She's great, but it's a bit tall task. (laughs) As she's watching at home. Love you, dear. Okay. Um, But how's he say to tell what's in your heart. A good heart produces good out of its treasure. An evil heart out of its treasure produces evil. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Even a basic litmus test are, how are your words? If you are good at misleading yourself about your heart, are you speaking life? What's your mouth doing? What's coming out that's in there? I mean, sometimes we just need the practical, like, how can I get a grip on where my heart's at? Well, one way to get a grip, according to Jesus, is actually to say, like, what is my life saying, literally? Am I gossiping? Am I cursing God? Am I speaking evil? Am I lashing out? Am I quick to tell something that's going to build me up and tear someone down? Those all come out of the treasure of our hearts. You know, you hear stories about people that say, I never heard that person say a bad thing about anyone. Not too many of us, myself included, could that be said of. We need these litmus tests to remind us that what's inside will come out, even in things like our words. So I don't think we need a lot of application today, but just three reminders, maybe four, heading out real quick. Real quick, in your laugh. You haven't been around OCV that long, have you? Or maybe you have, but one, we need to guard our hearts. 
What do you let in? It's not uh, neutral. Entertainment, it's not just the movie, it's not just the show, it's not just a conversation, it's not just a thought that you let roll around. Those are all writing on your heart. What are you letting in? Guard it with all diligence, with all vigilance. Keep it, secure it, and tend it. You defend it and you tend it. You guard it from what's outside and you keep it. It's like a gardener, right? You get the weeds, you take care of the predator, you take care of you know, the herbivores, I guess it would be, the, the, the rabbits or whatever. You, 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 t- you defend your garden, but you tend it. You water it, you nurture it, you, you thin out the things that shouldn't be there. There's no cruise control for a Christian in this idea of keeping your hearts with all diligence. You don't put it on autopilot for a week. If you do, just like a garden, you come back and the weeds are there. Secondly, we can't trust our hearts. Don't listen to Disney. If you've heard me say it once, you've heard me say it 1,000 times, okay? Listen to your heart is a, you know, let your heart guide you is a quick recipe to despair, okay? Teenagers, just hear me. Take my word for it, all right? It doesn't work out in life quite like Disney. There's way more Hanses, as my girls will be quick to tell you. Those Hans, you got to watch out for Hans, okay? There's way more of them out there than Disney lets on, okay? We got to beware of rationalizations. Watchfulness is a word the church has said forever. Watchful, be vigilant. Take an inventory of your words. Words to your kids. Words to your spouse. <laughs> words, words that just come out when you're mad in, in the house. What stories do you tell about people? Are you breathing life or death out of the treasure of your heart? And that leads me to the third point. We Christians should be people defined by repentant hearts. Because we know we can't do this perfectly. We need to repent and let God cleanse us from the inside out through the blood of Christ. We should keep short accounts with God when we do mess up, which hopefully in our maturity becomes less and less as the Spirit works in us and forms us. We keep short accounts. We say, God, that was, you saw that. You know where that came from. It came from in here. I didn't even know it was there. Help me, forgive me, cleanse me. And we do it in, lastly, hope. You know how that passage in Jeremiah, the next few verses, verse 14 of Jeremiah, what's he say? Heal me, in Jeremiah 17. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. Amen. We can't do our own heart surgery. Not well enough. There's always a little infection that stays. Only Jesus. And his grace is so good. He doesn't say, I already did that once. You go find someone else. He'll keep doing it. And his heart, his heart, is to see us become more and more like him. Where from our heart, life flows in our speech, in our attitudes, in our actions, because it's all coming from where our treasure is. Let's pray. God, have mercy on us. Help us, help me. Help your church in this town to be like this. In this larger region and in your world, God. We pray against the lies of the enemy at the center of our being. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to do something that is like salve for a wound. And it's coming to the Lord's table and reminding ourselves that whatever the enemy says about our 
unworthiness. Because if you start thinking about this stuff and then you start doing the inventory, you can start getting a pretty big, if you're like me, a pretty big list pretty fast. But this is the time we'll remember in Jesus, we have a healer. And he invites us to his table. And he will cleanse our heart. So this is the meal that reminds us of all that. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he took the cup. And he told his disciples who were gathered around. Men with hearts that were all over the place that night. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you get together, do this in remembrance of me. And we're going to enter into that meal, but we're going to do it humbly. And we're going to do it with repentance. It's the only way forward. We don't take the kingdom of God by force. He invites us. Will you pray this prayer of confession with me? It's on this worship guide. I believe and confess that Jesus is truly the Christ, the Son of the living God, who came into the world to rescue sinners and redeem His creation. Today I confess that I have sinned against God in thought, in word, and deed, by what I've done and by what I've left undone. I have not loved God with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. Christ, have mercy on me and forgive me, that I may walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And he will. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In that confidence, let's eat and drink the Lord's table. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen, church. Let's sing about his faithfulness now.
rising to the setting sun as love endures forever we will carry on as love endures forever sing praise sing praise one more time sing praise sing praise forever God is shine on you this week and may he give you peace this week wherever you go. Go be God's people and God's creation. He's at work and he wants to use you. See you next week.